Before we begin, I just want to tell you there's the only reason that I'm up here. Brad Williams is my ophthalmologist, and he said if I didn't come, he'd cut off my basulta. <laughs> I'm here, Brad. All right, you're on. We up. Okay, learning objectives, quickly. Uh, we're going to cover these points as time allows. Uh, you can see on the screen, recognizing signs and s that you might get sued. If you've been sued, you know what those signs are. If you haven't, we need to look at that. Understanding why people sue physicians. What, what's motivation? What, what's their perspective? What's the perspective of the plaintiff lawyer who's filing the lawsuit? That's pretty easy. You probably already know that. Protecting yourself from possible lawsuits and steps to take if you get sued. So we're going to try to cover those objectives this morning. So why is this relevant? So this is an old survey, but from our experience, these numbers still hold pretty pretty true. Do you expect to be sued during your career? And this is across the different medical specialties. A significant majority, yes, expect to be sued. Have you been sued for malpractice? A majority of this survey say yes. Uh, there may be some sample bias in this. If I can offer a word of encouragement, in our experience, those who practice in your specialty are much less likely to get sued. I've had two ophthalmology cases. One was actually against an ER doctor. In both cases, Brad Williams was my expert witness. In both cases, we came out very clean. Um, do you feel that any of the cases filed against you had merit? These numbers, again, uh, 10 to 15 percent the physicians we represented did believe there was merit, and we tried to do the right thing and settle the case. Uh, but this is, this is some of the data that uh, uh, fits what we practice and have seen in our practice. You're gone. Uh, have you ever been sued for malpractice? The survey indicates, again, old, but from our experience, pretty, whole, pretty much holds. 58% yes, 42% no. Um, do any of these cases filed against you have merit? I think Steve already covered this, but he, he mentioned two cases you've had. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this since 1986. We, we represent nothing but medical care providers <clears throat> in malpractice cases, all specialties. I've had two ophthalmology cases. One was dropped, the other resulted in a defense verdict, as it should have. So you guys are probably low risk for, for a lawsuit. So why are we here anyway? Um, well, anyway. Uh, so let's look at some of these things. Signs you may get sued. <clears throat> why do people sue physicians? How do plaintiff attorneys view potential cases? Personal risk management. This kind of gets into some application for you guys. Uh, and you've been sued. Now what do you do? <clears throat> Indications, <clears throat> signs you may get sued. Let's look at that. Bad outcome. <clears throat> you do a simple procedure, you prescribe a, an appropriate medication for your patient, and, and they have a complication or a bad outcome. Why does that happen? How does that happen? You give an 81 milligram aspirin, what's the risk? Brain bleed, GI bleed, right? Pretty low risk, but a risk nonetheless. You, you prescribe an 81 milligram aspirin, and most patients do very, very well with that. 99.99%, that other 0.1%. They get a bad outcome, they're going to sue you. Why? Because nobody should have complications. <clears throat> Why do people sue physicians? Right um, excuse me. Uh, angry patient or family members. Patient may be doing okay. They say, hey, it's a complication. I understood this was possible. Uh, I'll live with it. We'll move on. <clears throat> and a, mem a family member or friend says, hey, Joe, you know, you can get, hire a lawyer and might get some money out of this. Oh, okay, well, let me go find a lawyer. That's easy. You know, they're on billboards, television ads. Substantial medical bills or costs. You know, real serious complication, <clears throat> typically an operative procedure <clears throat> where the, hosp the patient's hospitalized for an extended period of time. Uh, three days in a hospital can cost $30,000 just for nothing just to be there, room and board. So you, you have a patient in there that's ICU for 10 days <clears throat> from a surgical complication, they're gonna have a, a lot of medical bills, a couple hundred thousand perhaps, depending on the care. So that's motivation. 
Uh, substantial medical bills. We've talked about that. Patients with relatives in New Jersey. Uh, anybody from New Jersey? <laughs> no? Okay. <clears throat> this really happens. I mean, y y you know, oh, my brother-in-law, my cousin from New Jersey said, I ought to, ought to file a lawsuit, so I did. We, we've actually had those cases. <clears throat> uh, requests for medical records. You get a request for medical records, you know, from a patient, <clears throat> particularly it's on an attorney's letterhead, you know it's coming, strap it on, it's on the way. Uh, process server comes, knocks on your door, hands you the, in South Carolina, notice of intent to file a lawsuit, other jurisdictions, the lawsuit itself. <clears throat> um, and it's often unpredictable. So why that, why that patient sue me? I, you just didn't see it coming. So why do people sue doctors? We've already mentioned this money. Sometimes it's need. They get substantial medical bills. Maybe they've been out of work, lost income. They're feeling the stress and they see this as a way to relieve it. Other times it's opportunity. You've got someone who says, hey, something bad happened to you. You, you can get some money out of this. And there are people willing to take on those cases. Society cultural trends, many years ago, I uh, used to uh, refer to this as the Oprahization of America, but we've got a sense of no personal responsibility, even patients who never take care of their health don't think anything bad should happen. Unrealistic expectations, people always expect everything to go perfectly, and, and it's good because medicine has advanced to levels where things almost always do. Uh, Someone's got to pay if something bad happens to me. That mentality crosses all kinds of uh, aspects of culture. A lottery mentality, we've alluded to that. The media, daytime television, and uh, in this gym I go to, there's a local station that airs the morning news, and almost every local TV ad is, is for uh, attorneys seeking uh, clients to help with lawsuits. If you drive around this city and many cities around this country, you're going to see billboards advertising the same thing. So this is an inundation of culture uh, uh, that people are always aware of and, and is one of the factors. So there's other factors. Uh, anger. Uh, sometimes things happen that make a patient or family members angry. If they feel blown off in any way, if a doctor or provider does something that makes them mad. First time I saw this was uh, 28, 29 years ago and uh, had a case where a patient had a surgical procedure, came back to the office for outpatient, some drains had to be removed. The patient claimed that the doctor just jerked the drains out and it was very painful and she yelled out and the doctor scolded her and said, be quiet, I don't want people in the waiting room to hear you. I don't think that was exactly accurate. There's two sides to a story, but something happened that made her angry, and then when she had complications, that was a factor in driving the lawsuit. Uh, loose lips sink ships. That's back from World War II. Some of you might not remember that, <clears throat> but uh, you've heard that, and this is what it means. I had a case, represented a neurosurgeon. <clears throat> um, he, along with an ENT, were doing a uh, pituitary tumor removal. ENT cleared the way, they do super navigation, everything's synced. He gets the sort of nurses and gets his number 11 blade to make that, here we go, cut. And you know, there are these two little things called the right and left carotids that kind of curve into that space. You can't see them. So he made the cut. Right red blood comes rushing out. Yeah, he nicked the right carotid. They stabilize the patient got him ready to go, sent him to a neurosurgeon in another venue who could do embolizations. <clears throat> and the transferee neurosurgeon, I mean, they got him there in pretty good shape. Transferee neurosurgeon goes in and examines a patient. Family members are, you know, guys, what's happening to dad, you know? Oh, oh by the way, this is interesting. Just back up. The reason he wanted the surgery, in spite of all the complications and risk that he was well informed of, it was encroaching, the tumor was encroaching his optic nerve. And he said, I can't live blind. That was his motivation to get in there. And so they did, and a terrible complication. Anyway, so the, the subsequent treating physician in whose hands my clients sent this man in stable condition, examines him upon transfer at the new facility, walks out into the family waiting room and says, quote, 
I don't know what they did over there, but I'll see if I can fix it. The man died under her watch, but they sued my guy. We got a defense verdict. We're very thankful for that. But that, that's the kind of stuff. So when you get a patient from another physician in any specialty, you might think, man, they screwed this thing. I can't believe Keep those thoughts to yourself. Don't chart it. Don't tell family members. You know, you're, you're just going to spike a, a lawsuit. We've had several of those <clears throat> cases, and sometimes the first impression of the loose lip subsequent provider turns out to be very inaccurate because they didn't yeah. have all the information. Feelings of guilt. We see this come up uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, typical case is uh, I had a case where an elderly woman had a surgical procedure. After two nights in the hospital, she's still in the hospital. She's found dead. The son who uh, became the campaigner and the crusader for her case, it turned out that he had neglected her, had not been around, hadn't been at the hospital, and was feeling very guilty and was trying to compensate. And so feelings of guilt sometimes play a role in, in lawsuits. Another case that I've, I've got, it's ongoing, um, Ramos' case. <clears throat> it's not in this jurisdiction, but it's in South Carolina. A tragic story of a 26-year-old young man who presented to the hospital with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Neurosurgeons worked him up. Uh, they couldn't find a source of bleed. Protocol is wait a week, repeat it. They did. Still couldn't find anything. <clears throat> and he started having back pain, leg pain, decreasing leg mobility, and started losing uh, bowel and bladder function. They did uh, a specialized procedure. <clears throat> where they tried, they found out that he had a spinal AVM. That's like, you know, by T9. A spinal AVM just is, is crazy. So they did the procedure to find the thing and document where it was. He's under general anesthesia. They went to his mom and dad, wonderful people, and said, look, we, we need to either operate by the neurosurgeon or try an embolization with my client, the neuroradiologist, interventional neuroradiologist, skilled at embolization. Is it's really risky? He may be paralyzed when he gets out of here, and he may die if I take him to surgery. Parents, he's under anesthesia. W will you give consent? Dad says, Yeah, yeah. They did the embolization. It was successful. It stopped the bleeding. There was an aneurysm in addition to the AVM, a nidal aneurysm. They saved his life, uh, and he was paralyzed. He's 27 years old and is in a wheelchair the rest of his life. They filed a lawsuit against my client. Not the neuros and the neurosurgeons. And I took the deposition of one of the treating neurosurgeons just a couple of weeks ago. Dad was in the room with his son, a wonderful young man. And I looked over at him as I was asking the neurosurgeon about what was going on. And you could just see the shock on his face. Oh my God, why did I consent to let them do that? It paralyzed my son. So there's that great sense of guilt, like I did that. And that's just an example, a recent example. Lots of examples like that. Sometimes when you ask people why they brought a lawsuit, they said, I just wanted to understand why this happened to my loved one. Why did he or she die? Why did they, they suffer like this? Uh, I think sometimes that claim is, is genuine. Other times it's not. It's just a good thing to say. Uh, I have had only one case, let's see, get this back here, only one case where after the trial, after we won for my client, the person on the other side whose uh, loved one had died came up and apologized and said, now I understand what happened, sorry about bringing the lawsuit. But that is one of the reasons you will often hear as to why people bring lawsuits. Uh, the second point there is unmet expectations. I do a lot of, we have frequent flyers in our business. You can imagine the specialties. What would be, in your opinion, a little Q&A, me to you, what do you think would be the two highest specialties that get sued the most? Any? OB. OB, anesthesiologist, who, who? Radiology. radiology, neurology, neurosurgery, ortho. Anybody say emergency room? What kind of relationship does an emergency room doctor have with this patient? What kind of continuity of care can he provide? What kind of history does they have with that patient? Zero. Zero. ER, ER docs, high risk specialty. They do great work. That's a real frequent flyer. And the OB is the second one. Why? Any, anybody have any kids? 
I got 12 grandkids, <laughs> three kids, terrific. Uh, so, y y <laughs> and one of them's a doctor, huh? anyway. <clears throat> so you, you go into labor, mom and family's around and everybody's excited and you get a shoulder dystocia, which every OB expert says is an obstetrical emergency, unpredictable, unforeseeable, and unpreventable. But you gotta deal with it. And you gotta, the time is clicking, just like it is on us. The time is clicking, you gotta get that baby delivered or you can suffer permanent brain damage or death. Or you have a bad set of strips and you take the kid to, the mom to the operating room, <coughs> room for emergency C-section, baby comes out with a pH of you know, 6.8, base excess of minus 30, just terrible, gorked out, cerebral palsy. You get a result like that, Doc, if you're an OB, count on getting sued. You, there's a three-year statute of limitations. Keep your powder dry. It's going to happen. Why? Because there's, there's, there's always these expectations. You go into an operation, and you get all this wonderful informed consent of all the risks, complications, alternatives. You sign the thing, say, yeah, it's fine. You're always thinking, we're always thinking, you and I are always thinking, <laughs> if it's us or our family. Yeah, I know that, yeah, I know it can happen, but, you know, less, less than 1%, what are the odds? And it happens to you, you say, well, the doctor must have screwed up. And that's a motivation for a lot of lawsuits. This is your <laughs> Perspective of the plaintiff's attorneys. Enough said? They get 33 and a third percent of every dollar from an award or settlement. 40 percent. But, but now, most of them are charging 40 to 45 percent of every dollar. Next thing I want to talk about. Oh, retrospective. Oh, the retrospective scope. Is that on my slide? Yeah. I missed that. Right there. Hindsight. Where is that on mine? Oh, it's right there. I don't have, I don't have, yeah, I know, where, wait, where's my readers? Uh, Brad's his doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to flunk that test next time I come in there. Uh, the retrospective scope, hindsight, this is their perspective. Every expert in every case, regardless of, of the specialty, this is what they do. You got to have an expert for the plaintiff before you can file a lawsuit, at least in South Carolina. They hire an expert at $27,000 an hour, or whatever they charge, to review a case. And you know what they do? They look at the record and say, well, what did he do? Oh, he did this. Oh, well, I'm going to say that's, in hindsight, you know, if he hadn't done that, that wouldn't have happened. Well, that's malpractice. Or he didn't do a CT scan. Oh, and that's how he missed a diagnosis. Oh, that's what we'll call malpractice. Every single case we have is exactly the same. It's what you do that, that the expert says you shouldn't have done in hindsight, or what you didn't do that could have changed the outcome, and that's hindsight. And that's, that is their perspective in every one of these cases. They'll start and say if they can go back and find something different uh, than what really happened, then, then they can pursue a lawsuit. And there's usually experts who are willing to go along with that. Uh, so here's some um, risk factors to deal with and, and some suggestions. Charting is very important because that's what will get scrutinized if there's a lawsuit. They ask for the medical records, they put it under a microscope, they give them to experts and, and try to find some gaps. Many of you, maybe most of you, maybe all of you are taught to chart by exception. So you, you chart the, the abnorm, abnormalities and, and often leave alone uh, pertinent negatives. And yet once in a while, the pertinent negatives the charting of that makes all the difference. I had an ER case where a patient developed a real horrible abscess uh, in the mouth, uh, beneath the tooth, and wound up having to be hospitalized for, for quite a long time. But had come to the ER earlier, and what saved the doctor is she did not only chart what she <coughs> found on exam, but she charted no redness, no warmth to touch, no edema or swelling, and charted all the pertinent negatives. So maybe you don't always need to do that, but always be mindful of could it be helpful in hindsight under scrutiny if I charted some pertinent negatives. At least it shows you thought about them and considered them and why you ruled them out. 
Um, good documenting and, and charting is know and remember that you are responsible for the information in your chart. And this comes up a number of times. I'm dealing with a case right now where a patient came to an ER and without giving you all the details, among other things, a culture was drawn. Uh, the patient was sent home. Uh, three days later, the patient came back to the ER. The culture had resulted as a positive culture. It was a staph aureus. About two hours after that resulted on the system, the patient came back to the ER. The provider somehow did not look into the chart and find that culture that was available and therefore did not treat and follow up and respond as the provider should have done with that culture result available to him in, in his own chart. And now we've got a, a very, very big lawsuit. Uh, we, I could tell you several stories like that, but if there's information in your record, you're responsible for it. So make sure you take the time to look and be aware of it. Audit trails. Audit trails. Every plaintiff lawyer in every case these days subpoena the hospital or usually it's a hospital or your office for audit trails because everybody's got EMRs. <clears throat> As you know, an audit trail will document every time you open that chart, it'll timestamp it with your initials or name uh, or your, your, your identifier. So um, be careful. When a lawsuit's filed, don't go back into your EMRs and go, let me do another attestation. <laughs> it'll, it, 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 it will cost you a lot of money. Now, but just, be aware, just be aware of the EMRs. Every time you go in and touch it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to timestamp your name, time, date, everything. And this used to be rare, but now we get requests for audit trails in just about every case. They're just trying, they're fishing, trying mm -hmm. to find something that they can pick on. Good timely consults. This goes along with uh, the retrospectoscope, hindsight. If you had only referred this patient to this specialist, this might not have happened. Or whatever referral you did, depending on the facts and the course at issue in the case, if you had referred the patient earlier, this outcome might uh, not have occurred. So again, another hindsight approach, but one of the things that is commonly an issue in our cases. Uh, tests and studies, <clears throat> um, they will always criticize you if you didn't order the test or didn't order the study. That If they had only ordered that test, it would have ruled out or ruled in this da-da-da-da-da that they ended up having. And that may not be true, but that's what they're going to say. There's a reason why you didn't order that test. There's a reason why you didn't order that study. Why, in your clinical judgment, it wasn't indicated. That's within standard of care. But if you don't do it and, and there's a complication resulting or flowing potentially, arguably, from that, that's what you're going to get gigged for. Use of antibiotics, medications, or lack of prescriptions for same. You know, if they had just ordered just amoxicillin, it's like $1.39 for a whole bottle or whatever it is now. Well, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, lady ended up having Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They misdiagnosed it didn't order the simple little antibiotics and she lost some digits, but got a big verdict. Should have ordered the antibiotics. Of course, hindsight's a great tool. I don't think they give you all crystal balls in your residencies or fellowships, but maybe, maybe one day. Uh, another common attack is differential diagnosis, and this is a big game with lawyers. Uh, it involves their having the benefit of hindsight uh, but what they often do with a differential diagnosis is they try to get you to agree with a definition that says something like this. You take the presentation, what you know, and you think about and consider and make a mental list of potential etiologies. And they will ask you this, and so, uh, you know, do you agree this is differential di a diagnosis? And then out of those potential etiologies, you take what presents the greatest risk of harm or death to a patient, and you work it up. You order tests, whatever needs to be done, and either you diagnose and treat it or you rule it out and move on, and it sounds real good. But what they leave out is you also take into account what's likely. And if something presents the greatest risk of harm, but it's less than 1% chance, and there's something else that you're like 80 or 90% certain that's what it is, you may not order the test for that 
very rare possibility. But it's a game they play, and they have the benefit of hindsight, and they can uh, 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 attack you or try to lure you into a trap on differential diagnosis. <clears throat> Where are we? We don't have time for that. We got two minutes. I can do that. Okay. <laughs> We're running over. We'll skip Here, through some I'll, of our I'll cut to this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, informed right. consent is very important. You've probably heard this, but you need to document obviously the procedure and the treatment that you discuss the risks and alternatives, maybe mention some of them. You don't have to mention every possible complication. You need to document that the patient comprehended it. And I always like to see that you offered the patient an opportunity to ask questions and all questions were answered. Or if there was a loved one, a spouse, a parent, something like that, uh, that they were present and uh, uh, were a part of this. Uh, it's also important to um, uh, document this in a procedure note. Even mm -hmm. though the procedure note may be prepared after the procedure, again, repeat that informed consent. It, it can't be covered uh, too many times. And so, let me just uh, give you this is a chart from one of my clients who went to trial a couple months ago, did get a defense verdict, an OBGYN case, GYN surgery. I'm going to read you his informed consent. Planned laparoscopy, laparoscopy with possible laser hysterostomy DNC. The diagnosis, proposed treatment with its risk and benefits and alternative treatments, surgical and medical, with the risk and benefits were discussed with the patient. The risk of doing nothing was discussed. The patient understood the concepts as discussed, agreed to proceed. The patient was provided with appropriate literature. The patient had the opportunity to ask questions and those questions were answered. The most common complications associated with laparoscopic procedures include infection, yada, 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 bowel bladder injury. Most common complication associated with hysteroscopy procedures is perforation of the uterus with an instrument created, with an instrument creates a tear through the uterine wall. Other common complications include bleeding, infection, etc. Complications of a DNC are rare, but they can occur. They include all that. We discussed perhaps just starting her on some type of hormonal con contraception versus proceeding with hy hysteroscopy and laparoscopy. She was, she was to proceed, she wanted to proceed with surgery. She understands that we may not find anything. He got halfway into the rectal wall because she had endosalpingitis. And, and the patient sued the doctor in spite of one of the best documented office informed consents I've ever seen. All right, lawyers are not known for being succinct, so I think we've run out of time, but if you get sued, don't panic. Promptly notify your insurer. You cannot delay that. Uh, preserve all records. Do not let any of them be altered or adjusted. Don't uh, be tempted to uh, modify them in any way. Uh, you can research medical literature that might help support your case. Meet as early as you can with defense counsel and cooperate with uh, de defense counsel and then get personal support. Uh, I know Brad uh, tries to help people when they go through lawsuits and, and there are others. And so um, here we go. We're sorry to have to cut through some of that, but uh, uh, they say in the old, old days, I don't know when, lawyers got paid by the word, so we're not... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we don't brief. get paid by the word. Anybody have any questions? How many of you have been involved with a lawsuit, either as a someone sued or someone who's been an expert witness? I'm going to throw this one thing out uh, that I think is, is real important about when you get sued, what you should do, in addition to what Steve said, which I agree. Last thing, do a memo. Put down, write down in a computer document everything you can remember about the patient, the case, details, everything. On the top of it, say, for my attorney only. It's protected, and the other side can never get it, but it'll help you remember more specifically what happened. Thank you.